after an excellent introduction uh, into public spaces in culture and their models in culture in general, we are going to continue in one specific direction. We are going to talk about public spaces dissonance with a special focus on their using, reusing, and sometimes abusing. This topic is important not just for our case studies, but also for many other institutions, monuments, uh, and places that were once very successful, sustainable, and important, and now they are abandoned, devastated, forgotten, or even destroyed. Um, that is the reason why several, dif several different perspectives are going to be introduced here today. Uh, one assumes historical context focused on memory view, revisionism, and how and why we remember these spaces. The other is going to include artistic point of view and artists as potential users. Uh, and finally, we would like to consider heritage practices, narratives, and their role in the current cultural context that seeks to identify, understand, and valorize common heritage within the EU policies. Unfortunately, our other uh, participant, second participant, Mr. Dragan Merkovina, is not here today with us. He has some health issues. We wish him fast recovery. But with us here today is Ms. Uh, Liljana rogac mietovic uh, And I think that her presentation is going to be an excellent continuation of what Natasha has been talking about. Ms. rogac mietovic is a research fellow at the Institute for Theatre, Film, Radio and Television of the Faculty of Dramatic Arts. She, le she lectures, lectures at MA and PhD studies. And she published over 40 papers, a book, and also edited a few international publications in, in cultural sustainability cultural memory and cultural relations. So, yeah. Thank you very much. I'm really uh, grateful to be here today with you because uh, it wasn't planned. So this is also kind of a, a very good opportunity to, to hear uh, interesting presentations and also some inspirational uh, debates. Uh, I would just say this is uh, yeah, the railway station roof of, uh, in New York City. And the thing that I'm going to talk about is actually just a part of my wider obsession right now, and that is about the railway and traveling, and especially in the context of um, the Balkans and the railway, and I hope that this will be a big research project. So um, this huge uh, quote by Marcel Proust is actually uh, here because I wanted to stress these words and also to say that uh, I conceive actually uh, and, and um, uh, experience travel uh, as a, a kind of a process that has a big transformative potential. And I think that that's also a word that we've been uh, mentioned yesterday. So how to uh, conceive public spaces and their transformative uh, potential. Of course, uh, here also uh, some other words like distance, difference, uh, performing, etc. But the presentation will be there, so if you're interested, it's. Um, I'm talking about um, the interplay of space and memory and how in recent theoretical developments the memory and space are being actually reconceptualized. So public articulation of memory is informed by the discourses and institutions of the public sphere. So it is contextualized in new forms of culture politics that include exactly transformation, dissonance, tension, instability, etc. And I have to stress for the sake of our participants at the panel that here the word dissonance is really not used uh, uh, as part of the concept of dissonant heritage by um, the British scholars, but really in the more colloquial sense. So the importance of social and material factors in the cultural memory studies inquiry within the context of an erosion of a film, spatial, temporal, and historical references is what I uh, want to say that uh, are important. Now, um, oh, this is still uh, what I want to say, these, uh, these three uh, quotes. Um, since I will be talking actually today more about the railway, but not too much about the Balkans, but in a way it is a kind of transcendence of real geography uh, from 
uh, what we call symbolic geography. So I just want to say that a critical approach that Maria Todorova has uh, towards uh, this um, symbolic geography is also what uh, is important for me. On the other hand, memory is uh, also subject to the ongoing negotiation, cross-referencing and borrowing, and it is a part of the paradigm shift that moves beyond the normative claims over the past in the public sphere. So we are talking uh, and uh, starting from the traces of memory, reassembling of history, reenactment of memory, uh, all the way to the reordering of the knowledge itself. Um, now, uh, we want to say also that, uh, and want to focus basically on these new perspectives on the interaction of memory and space, showing both the conceptual shift and its manifestations and shaping uh, that specific cultural memory topographies, it is cartographies. And um, this is before this slide, but nevertheless, I'm not good with these uh, technical things anyway. Um, I want to say also that this brings us to the question of methodology of research, of this kind of research, that in a way has to be both multi-perspectival, multi-theoretical, multi-methodological, uh, and also sometimes eclectical, if you want. Um, now, the railway. Um, the railway conceived as a public space, as expression of urbanity, memory space, and also kind of symbolic uh, space. This is a uh, part of the poem by uh, Anton Gustav Matos, and I don't really think it's a good translation, that Željeznicu već guta daljina. So, um, the railway here is taken as a paradigmatic example of the previously conceptualized interplay of memory and space. So railway, I mean the stations, the tracks, the carriages, are taken as settings of both public and private life. And the very approach to the railway as a social space is drawing upon the um, thinking of uh, Lefebvre and Desertot and other people as an ongoing dynamic process involving nature, politics, culture, and history. So here, space is taken as a social morphology, as an uh, image of very complex mobilities. Uh, being literally a space in and out of conduits, the railway is in wider sense a constitutive of social meaning, and just as social meaning continually shapes its social structures. We really had a last night wonderful uh, lecture about social structures as, uh, uh, as I saw it as well. So in the space of the railway, we can see the, the tension in between its political meaning that is constantly reconfigured. And thus the railway is seen as a site of challenge and contestation. Um, while railway itself has often been perceived as a machine that annihilates both time and space and thus is uh, deprived of its um, indexical meaningfulness as kind of landscape of memory, on the other hand, uh, railway actually opens up new spaces uh, as spaces in between, so this might be also the starting point, but also the place of arrival, a transitory space. Um, of course, it's a zone of connectivity across various levels as well. And um, I want to say that the railway stations as public spaces hold this potential of resolving tensions regarding the past exactly dissonant notions and interpretations of places, people, and their identities. And thus, we want to investigate the pot potentiality of railway in both discursive, symbolic, and material spatial notions in recreating the past and heritage and conceiving the new roles for these public spaces for community. 
that is to say, to encourage transformations of these spaces through theoretical practices of strategizing, mediating, assembling, but also animated by uh, scripting, reframing, and also through applied practices. And now, the railway as an axis for uh, rethinking the heritage of um, uh, former Yugoslavia. Um, here, I just, uh, for the sake of time, Milica, please, you will, five more minutes, okay? I will just go through, because some, some of the slides I think we, we saw in other presentations. Uh, I wanted just to show them as examples for reflecting upon this topic. So it is the beginning of my research and I uh, personally haven't even got into the full potential of this. So for many of you this is very uh, already known. It's um, uh, the, the so-called youth railways uh, as a part of the Omladinska Radna Akcija with the, uh, that uh, was actually the first railway uh, in Bosnia, uh, and uh, it was done completely actually by youth without any tough mechanization. And it reflected in a way this collective spirit like we are building the railway and uh, we are being built by the railway. As a uh, famous Miroslav Krleža writer said, this is certainly not the first railway in the world, but it is the first one built completely by the children. So here I reflect upon this uh, common action and if you want also um, co-creation of a specific public space. This is also very uh, already known, but why did I put this uh, blue train or uh, how is it called, the uh, peace train. It was a luxury train used by uh, Josip Broz Tito, the president of uh, ex-Yugoslavia, while um, it, it operated in more than 60 uh, countries. But nowadays is being used mostly in commercial and uh, touristic purposes. I don't want to say kitsch, but it's somewhere on the edge. So I think that the full potential of, uh, uh, for instance, this artifact is not being uh, recognized. Why? For instance, uh, the steam engines that carry the blue train are saved and they are kept in three uh, ex-Yugoslav uh, republics in, in cities. So in the, rail in the front of the railway stations uh, uh, in Belgrade, Zagreb and Ljubljana, actually in front of the very railway station in Belgrade and in front of the museums of these other two cities. This might be also a kind of incentive for rethinking the, uh, the blue train itself and its uh, symbolic meaning. <clears throat> this uh, I just want to call of everyone. It's very near here, so it's the old railway station in Skopje. And uh, why? It's uh, listed on a um, dark tourism uh, uh, site destination. It was the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest railway station in Balkans at the time, and uh, uh, it uh, was uh, completely de demolished in the earthquake in 1963. And from then, at that time, it was kept as a, uh, as a ruin, basically. But uh, it was really, uh, uh, and it is, part of the modernist heritage. Nowadays, uh, something is being done, but we will see on the very side what. Uh, I believe this uh, uh, is also very, very important side in the sense uh, of the railway um, as public spaces. Now, just uh, shortly, uh, probably some of you know this very famous uh, uh, sound installation by Bill Fontana. It's a sound sculpture. I just wanted to show it as an example of how one can really think also about. So it's, uh, it was installed in, it was uh, 1984 in Berlin. Uh, the sounds were taken uh, and uh, recorded uh, in Köln uh, railway station and then 
put into another context, into the station that does not work anymore. So here we have this example of layering the past and the present and also intertwining these two uh, uh, in, in these different spaces. This has been Liliana, shown... sorry, two more minutes. Maybe you it, should it will be two more minutes, thank you. Uh, so this was also shown already by Professor Milena, so I won't tell anything else except that Professor Milena was part of the very council in, in, uh, for the exhibition in Belgrade and that was really a big, big project. And finally, as the last example, uh, also that has something to do with the uh, people who are actually uh, authors of this project is Project Art in Public Space, Belgrade for Travels in First Encounter, that was realized in uh, Belgrade Railway Station in uh, 2014. And it was a kind of collaborative uh, project of few artistic groups that uh, were uh, with the aim to, to rethink uh, the, the image of the railway station setting as a first uh, spot that uh, people who come to Belgrade actually um, come to. So uh, just another example, you have a lot of, uh, about it on the internet. And I conclude here. Um, the railway stations uh, can function, in my belief, as a setting for community interaction, as a, but also as, of course, venue for different performances. And um, uh, to link these transitory spaces, or if you want to call in-between spaces to community institutions and cultural assets is a kind of a, a, a goal. Uh, and different strategies in this sense can be used, either temporary space use, uh, so the ability to, to kind of temporarily fill a, a gap with a new significance and in experience, and also what uh, is called the processual transformation, so meaning um, recreating spaces from the abandoned or silenced or ignored spaces into usable creative spaces uh, in urban environments. Uh, this uh, also might be uh, a kind of uh, uh, incentive for focusing on new ways of tracing and enacting as we all heard these names, participatory, participatory collaborative, inclusive, uh, if you want sustainable practices in public discourse, but also finding new ways, really, of uh, collectivities and solidarity. I think I was in time. Thank you. Thank you, Liliana. I'm sure that we're going to have a lot of questions for you afterwards. Um, another proposition for public spaces transformation comes from our third participant, Mr. Danilo Pernet. Mr. Pernet is an artist born in Montenegro, based in Belgrade. Currently, he's doing his PhD studies in Switzerland. Uh, for today, he has chosen a very interesting topic to speak about. Uh, that is something that is very familiar to us from this region, but it is actually very unusual for people outside. He's going to talk about houses of cultures, a very special sort of cultural center. So, Danilo, the floor is yours. You can okay, start. Thank you. Fifteen minutes, please. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, well, I'll first uh, say, uh, say uh, how actually I came to this idea to deal with the uh, houses of culture. Uh, because I'm an artist and at some point of my practice and art and uh, work uh, in general, I face with that problem to, to fit my projects, my work into a present system, which was totally dominated by liberal cultural institutions and I understand that uh, I need to start rethinking the system of production in which I'm placing my work and what I'm doing uh, and to be maybe more uh, self-reflexive uh, to, to have this kind of approach even more. So by looking where to go, because I realize that all the institutions are somehow closed for uh, something like that, we somehow, as a part of one group, I, I need to say that also, we start, uh, it's called Dodatna Dopunska Nastava. Uh, there was a several of us. There is a group uh, Dopo Genger, Isidora is here, a group Kurs and me. Uh, we found ourselves as a kind of more left-oriented artist, let's say like that, and uh, we start looking for some space that we can, where we ca could work actually. 
And that's how uh, I start uh, being uh, much more interested in houses of culture because we realize these spaces uh, that are today mostly abandoned or uh, given by uh, given to some uh, structures. It's now very complex how that happened. Uh, that maybe that can be a place which we can reuse for this kind because we realize that how these uh, uh, houses of culture uh, were formed um, stayed actually in a much healthier pace. Um, and of course this was all illusion. Somehow what, what was actually clear at the end. But at the beginning uh, what is really important to say and this is I think very uh, important for this discussion is that uh, cultural houses of culture were organized by the contributions of the workers of the dominant industry of the place where uh, this cultural institution was organized. So it's not organized by state like that. Or of course, it's a, even more complex if there is a youth center, there is a different structures of institutions. But for example, if you want a place, there is a factory that is producing, I don't know, uh, what some things, uh, shoes, uh, that cultural institution was organized by the, I don't know, for example, 60% of the uh, uh, contributions for the workers that are coming from uh, that factory, 20% for the workers of, uh, who are working in the post offices or this or that. So actually the workers uh, were giving their uh, contributions to build their own institution. and. Uh, this is something that today we are totally lacking. And with the process of privatization, it was becoming uh, very, uh, even more complex because if one factory was sold, the, the new owner of the factory, private owner, of course, or corporation or something like that, they, uh, that owner star, uh, uh, actually received all the property of the factory among the other, it was uh, uh, some percent of the space into cultural center, for example. So that's how actually in some moment, uh, and they start using this uh, space, for example, renting it, usually it was a renting, uh, and then we had a totally uh, crazy uh, turns actually. For example, in one cultural center in the middle of Belgrade, you, uh, we had a pink television that is show, uh, because they are just, uh, this is very kitschy television, uh, and uh, that's how actually these spaces totally uh, disappeared somehow from our public and become commercialized and so on. Of course, that it's even more complex because um, in some moment, for example, for a city of Belgrade, it was like that um, social democrats wanted to show how to say that they take care about culture and they uh, put their hand on the cultural houses of culture that are in the city of Belgrade but not all around but in a practice it become uh, actually the way how to take money from the public uh, uh, through the cultural center to the party because uh, these uh, centers were led by the people who are uh, put it there by the party. And uh, it all, I mean, this sto story how these institutions were somehow distanced from the people, from the re real life, somehow it's uh, very complex. But what I would like uh, here to pose is a question and what I somehow was faced with while researching also Macedonian scene and going into uh, terrain and looking for some spaces. Uh, that it is very difficult to say how, what kind of institution we now can uh, renew because we are also uh, some kind of institution as an artist, as a cultural workers, and it is. Uh, and I realized that on every terrain where I was, it was really the, the culture was different, and uh, the people, the, the, the social structure of the people, the, their needs, and so on. It's totally different than the need that I, for example, have. And uh, it is difficult to realize on this kind of uh, event or something what, what would be a kind of perfect institution without really rethinking the context and. Um, structure of the people uh, and some spaces. For example, I was in uh, Georgia Petrov. Uh, this is a kind of on the suburb of the Skopje. It is a cultural center. And uh, the, the director of that cultural center is a, a folk musician. But, for example, he was really struggling with the uh, city 
and with uh, uh, he was suing at law and uh, trying to bring the cultural center back to the Mesna Zajednica, kind of local government. Uh, and it was a process in law like a 15 or 20 years and he succeeded. For He, show, he presented the law that uh, that cultural center does, does not belong to the city or summer and, and, uh, uh, and he showed that this is uh, financed by the contribution of the people of that place. And for example, his story is totally grassroots, bottom up, like opening for everyone. Uh, it is really interesting to see, like, uh, we have a church organizations here, people who are in a retiree, um, the different folklore uh, organizations, it's a full day program like direct democracy, open doors for everyone, we don't rent, we don't earn the money, but then actually he exists as a very good tampon zone between a uh, political, dominant politician, political party in that village which use the cultural center to present their policy as a open to the people and so on. So, so he, he become very important cultural and, uh, uh, entrepreneurs because, and he was called by the different villages and different cities, even some cities in Serbia, to organize the cultural center in, in these places. But this is actually interesting. What we will actually do if we take back these spaces, on which way we don't have today the structure because to, to, to renew it, uh, except we put this liberal structure, entertainment, uh, industry or something like that. It is totally, we are living in a totally different society where, where there is actually no society. There is only a state structure or, or there is a private entrepreneurship. So it's difficult to renew it. And I think, but I think th those are the questions that we need really to face with. Uh, how to really structure, structurally uh, change this and what actually this institution should be. Um, because we are cultural workers, we are somehow distanced from the people uh, really, I mean we are kind of uh, middle class, there is no working people at all anywhere, uh, even in these uh, places. How to really be bottom up but having uh, classes from the bottom that are articulated not just as an audience but as a real producer and to feel that institution is their institution. And this is really, I think, a question. Thank you, Danilo. You actually saved us two more minutes for the discussion later. Okay. Um, our next participant uh, comes from Amsterdam, Ms. Klaske Voss. She is postdoctoral researcher at the Access Europe and she lectures European studies at the Humanities Faculty of the University of Amsterdam. She is interested in cultural policy, cultural heritage, and particularly she is interested in this region, so that's why she is today here with us. And we are looking forward to, to her presentation. Let me see. Yes, I have it on. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here, honestly, and um, I feel a bit that I'm moving slightly away from the local perspective somehow because I've been asked to talk more about the European perspective, um, which is in many ways muddy territory as well, I think, <laughs> talking about this. And we already talked about the many wordings you know, that are used and... Um, yeah, unavoidably, I will talk about that as well, because this is obviously what we talk about when we talk um, about the theme that I've been looking at. And in my latest research, I'm really focusing on, so how does this funding of projects impact in a region that's not yet part of the European Union? So this is also how I got invited for this conference. How does that work out in this region where things work out differently, where there are other aims and ambitions and the like? And um, generally you could say that in Europe or the European Union uh, and the Council of Europe, I mean the more European actors uh, that, that are uh, in play, they have been working on what I call a so-called uh, so European infrastructure of cultural production and I use production also um, consciously. And it does not only involve member states, as I said, it increasingly involves also accession states or those countries that are not yet part of the European Union. They are allowed to be part of this. And the idea really is to, to facilitate the creation of a shared European cultural space. And I thought this was interesting for what we talk about here um, today. It should thicken the EU citizens' rather thin European identity, but also facilitate European integration in a wider uh, sense of the world. 
of the word. And um, yes, this notion of European cultural space is what I will start off with in this presentation. What does that mean? What do we talk really about when we talk about that? But then I quickly move away from that and we'll look at the difficulties of creating such a space. Why is it obviously, it is an ambition, but why does it stay rhetoric and is it so hard to translate into practices? And I will conclude by trying to find some answers to the question, how can public spaces be modeled in such ways that dissonance becomes a tool for exchange? And this is how I relate to dissonance as well. Um, because it seems that allowing for dissonance seems to be the only way of um, forming any kind of identity, not the least European identity. So to start off with, so what is a European cultural space if we talk about and how it's been written and talked about this? And it's most general sense, I would say it has been presented as a space of flows um, instead of a space of places. And these two notions actually come from Manuel Castells. You might have heard of his book on the network society, and I think it links up with many things that we talked about here today as well, um, saying that a space of place refers to a locale whose form function can meaning are self-contained within the boundaries of a physical contiguity. And the idea is really a space of places is the resulting organization of European experiences as rooted locally. Instead, the space of flows that the European Union seems to aim for refers to an alternative organization or logic, where social practices are enabled and constrained by the contemporary global flow of goods and people, signs and information. And in relation to the notion of the European cultural space, the reference is very much made to the interaction and construction of European culture across borders. Due to the social practices that are enabled in this transnational European space of flows, um, people are connected in different parts of Europe. So the emphasis seems to be on enabling interaction and cooperation and not so much, much on this existence of a space of places, the rootedness locally. It's much more fluid in that sense. And I've talked with quite a few people at the Commission, you know, and other actors, representatives of the European Union, and they confirm this very often when I ask them, so what is European culture then? What do you actually present? And he said very often, well, we're much more looking for a high level of cooperation than a certain European theme. Many of the projects we support look for regional, local culture, but we promote them on a European level. And yeah, this struck me, you know, so, so where are we actually heading to, you know, if we talk about this as well, it seems that they try to deal with cultural difference on a European level by harmonizing it under a sort of umbrella of a shared European approach to culture that increasingly instrumentalizes culture for an enormous variety of European purposes. Um, so forms of cooperation determines the Europeanness of culture, the methods or the approaches used, or the certain standards that you have to um, comply with if you apply for European Union funding. So these more applied aspects of culture, the so-called social practices that Castells also referred at, have to enable a co-construction of European culture, as they would frame that uh, in the nice European wordings. Um, and by doing that, there will be automatically or in time an appropriation of European culture in all the variety it has. Um, and the European Union seems convinced that those investments in culture or in the cultural sector stimulate not only this transnational cooperation or economic growth, and we already talked about neoliberalization, capitalism playing a role as well, but they also feel that this might eventually lead to more identification with the European Union, so participating in this space. I mean, we talked about this in quite a few occasions already, uh, and this seems to be particularly relevant for non-members. It's very much emphasized in the context of the region we speak at, you know, that citizens need to participate in the space and engage in more mainstream approaches to feel that they're more part of Europe. It's, it's very much used in that sense. Um, and I think this expectation is also interesting in what we discuss here in Skopje, you know, the different actors in place, because what they try to do is to create spaces that somehow promote more openness. Uh, we talked about this horizontality. Uh, I read this in the, in the, uh, in the description, solidarity, inclusion. Um, they try to create spaces that bring about a sense of belonging. They try to create a space in which everyone could feel at home somehow, so every story is represented, um, and do justice to different patterns, interpretation of memory and heritage. And in, in many ways, it's a strategic thing to leave it so open as they actually do. Um, 
And they seem to be particularly relevant when we try to look at what is a European cultural space and how would that function, both within the confines of the European Union um, and beyond. And here I think the notion of dissonance comes in, or what I call sometimes zones of awkward uh, engagement. This is really what I very often frame, these instances of transnational cooperation. Um, and um, I would like to focus now a bit more on, so okay, why is it then so difficult to create this European space? It looks so nice on paper, but what's actually happening in the field? And we'll draw a bit on my experiences in the region uh, as well in my earlier research. Um, and many explanations can be provided why it is so difficult to create such a European cultural space. So I'm going to focus on three of them, but I know that there are probably more of them. And the first one is that, and it seems to be a very straightforward one, but it determines very much what happens on the European uh, level, European cultural policy always has to compete with other hegemonic identifications, um, such as local, national, regional ones, and the European one almost never takes precedence. I think this is generally what's happening. Uh, it seems that European identification almost always comes out the worst. That's the last thing we will relate to. Um, and. Um, in this sense, the resonance of the initiative has been rather weak, generally, I would say, not only here. And some have argued that this is the result of a general sovereignty reflexor. We don't want to sort of uh, um, give up a sovereignty in a field of culture, which is so essential for what we are uh, on the state level, but also on the individual level, which determines many of the more sensitive EU fields. So this is not necessarily typical for culture. Um, and um, we see that even though many countries do invest in EU cultural policy, it's, it's part of the cultural strategies, everyone is focusing um, on this, there's still a lot of resistance against transferring too many competences to the European Union uh, in general. And um, yes, like I said, this negatively impacts of what's, what's happening in the field. Um, and I think it often leads to a certain amount of pragmatism even, um, and the establishment of European products. And this is what I saw also a lot happening here in the region. And Gisela Wells has given the definition of European cultural uh, products. These seems to be co social constructions infused with European Union values, standards, regulatory power, in which form seems to proceed continuously over content. Um, and um, as such, they don't really provide tools for identification, but merely a format to conform with. Make sure that you apply to the funding criteria, make sure that the form is in place. And I've seen this, for example, in a project that I've been focusing on years ago, with those in Serbia will know it, the Senske Rudnik, the, the coal mine that got funding from the European Union. And many would argue primarily because the man in charge really managed to get the form into place. You know, not necessarily the content. And um, last year, that whole program that was funded by the Council of Europe and the uh, European Union has been concluded because it was the moment that the European Union and Council of Europe said we'll give it to the countries themselves in a regional cooperation country. You make sure to continue the program, but then it stalled because hardly anyone felt the ambition to continue such a project that was so much based on form and not on content. They did not necessarily believe so much in this. So this is actually one of the factors why it is so difficult to work with this. Um, a second factor would be, I would say, that the way in which um, cultural policy is governed on a European level uh, and in the way in which policies are organized um, has led to an enormous amount of interpretation on what culture should be about. And, um, and this has, I think, two ways in which this is uh, expressed. Um, first of all, um, the implementation of all these programs is in the hands of, of the member states or those actually that get the funding or that actually um, yeah, uh, are supported there. They set the criteria, they are in that sense gatekeepers of many of the projects, but the, the responsibility is in the hands of the countries themselves. And um, as such, um, it will always be a projection of the member states, I would say, or the organizations that are involved um, in this. Um, and um, maybe one example to, be, to just um, cut this short because I'm not going to go too much into all of this, but this shared management, you know, very often the European Commission says we do shared management, so we evaluate the programs, but you yourself are going to be the ones or the integration officers that are organizing this, um, leads to the situation that there are frameworks for policy making, but uh, no guarantees regarding its eventual 
eventual implementation. And um, I think we've talked a bit about this already. For example, the UK was mentioned as a very particular way of dealing with culture, which contrasts massively with what's actually happening, for example, in southeastern Europe, or even the differences between northern Europe, you know, other areas in Europe in their approach to culture, which definitely influences the way in which these programs take form. And we see different developments in different parts of Europe, and also different frictions emerge because um, of that. I have one minute, Klaske. Okay, I'll do my best. Um, so across Europe, different interpretations um, coexist. I think you know that is definitely one aspect of it. Another one is, and I've mentioned just a few of them, and I think we've heard them throughout uh, the conference already, there are many uh, actors that are actually involved in that that have quite different ideas behind how to implement cultural policy on a European level. And to start off with, obviously, the Commission has different directorates generals that all seem to invest somehow in cultures. For example, you have DG uh, Enlarge, so that's about enlargement that has the EPA funds, and quite a few will know about this. They invest primarily in projects, or that's the idea, that it will stimulate enlargement, you know, the integration of the region into the European Union. The structural funds, you know, another actor that invests in culture also in this region, does a lot with infrastructure, tourism, socio-economic development, because it's about cohesion, it's about limiting the different economic situation of the countries. And DG EAC is doing something else. So within the European Commission, you already see many different approaches, but as I already argued, the states themselves have an idea behind, behind this um, the different civil society organization that we talked about, and this is maybe why I asked the question in the previous session, they don't seem to communicate very well, you know, and this is an interesting, I would say, situation of what's happening in the field. So it's very heterogeneous uh, situation of what happened, and it means different things to different actors. And this puts, I would say, institutions like Creative Europe Desk in a very difficult position, because what should they tell to people when they apply for European Union funding to just start off with, you know, because it could already mean so many different things, and yeah, there are other consequences about this as well. But for me, the main question would be, so how to co-construct a European cultural space if so many factors you know, are at play, if there's no single unifying factor that actually tells us what direction this is going to? People will unavoidably start uh, not understanding each other here. The last explanation, and I will do this short one before I go to the... Oh, these were different interpretations of culture, but I guess you get an impression of that. But the last uh, factor before I want to do more to the conclusion and the solutions is um, um, that actually there are many zones of awkward engagement involved in the implementation of European cultural policy. And this particularly has to do with the tension between bottom-up and top-down rules and regulations. I already mentioned the shared management uh, 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 system, but there are many more actually, and one is the, for example, this whole form over content discussion. You know, most of the EU action in the field is about funding, and it asks for conform, you know, acting conforming a certain form. Um, however, this turns out to be very problematic in the translation into practices, and I've seen that a lot in this particular region I'm focusing on, but it's a general European problem that many of these European cultural projects are developed, but then are very difficult to translate into practice, and many people from the region say these are prasna rechna papiri, and this is empty words on paper, you know, and what does it lead to, and what does it bring us eventually? Uh, and very often, for example, um, you might have your form your model in place, but local governance still need to support you in your co-funding. And if they are not necessarily interested in it or only have a very small budget, this will never sort of be involved into practice, leading to a massive amount of frustration, in particular for the local mediators that actually have to organize this in this shared management and have to transfer this to the to the people in place, and in particular, and many of you might recognize it, because European actors are hardly ever present in the field. They are not there to see what's actually going on. The Council of Europe is not at the actual place, or very often they are not there. Um, so these are just a few of these you know, matters that, that, that take place, and I think the problem is, in many ways, that we see a governing at a distance. Making criteria, you know, uh, talking about um, these uh, these models, trying to put them into place, but not being there. Um, but also in the region, um, many of the, the, the projects, uh, the actors in culture in the region act as 
partners, not as pullers of the whole projects. So even in, and this is by some seen as a blessing because they don't have to do all the administrative work that, for example, Germany has to do. At the same time, if it's about co-constructing European spaces, they always act from the sidelines in many ways, or at least their role is different than other countries in Europe and then the Commission. So, ways forward, and I'll try to comprise this as much as I can in, in, in the time that I have. Because what do we do with this? There are many zones you know, of awkward uh, engagement, dissonance. And yes, I think it always starts still for the allowance of them to coexist, awareness of that, and learning from that instead of taking them for granted. And this is, I think, what very often happens, because I do think the European Union can be an effective partner. You know, We should not dismiss it, but there needs to be more insight in how we deal with the dissonances. And first of all, it starts, and I'm not going to say so much about it, because it has been repeated over and over in the conference, yes, there needs to be room for these contradictory narratives and for those dissonances to exist because they will always be there. You know, it's, it's, it's an illusion to think that they will not exist. And um, the challenge is, I would say, not to see them as a threat or a danger, but to open up for this and allow for those different voices and counter voices to coexist. It's good to give free reign to contrasting memories and the like instead of focusing on a format uh, imposed from above uh, and a desirable European product um, cannot then only uh, be developed in, in terms of form, but also in content. But for example, national governments also need to realize that they should sometimes move away from too much content and think about other um, aspects of it. Second, um, I think there is, and this is a bit slippery territory also for me, but I do think there is a need for some kind of regulation, for some kind of common European denominator. You know, what, in which framework um, do we actually work? And obviously it's very difficult to see how to do this without imposing, without sort of being very sort of top down in this. But I do think, and you already mentioned, uh, I heard the, 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 the method of open coordina coordination, which is jokingly in the field of culture called the open method of cooperation. You know, we just talk groups and publish a lot of reports actually being in place. There seems to be more sort of a way of transferring the objectives in at least some kind of course, some way, way forward and some idea. So what do we talk about? Allowing for these dissonances, but also co-construct some kind of framework from which to work. And then finally, I think we should learn from these zones of awkward engagement. Uh, and I think this is not happening at the moment, you know, this, what we already discussed, differences in, for example, the area we focus on and the post-socialist models and how they affect the way culture works, there needs to be much more understanding about what that means and integrated in actually new dealings um, with culture on a European way. So attention needs to be paid to the setting in which these policies are implemented, um, but also sometimes to look more at content than form and Maybe to use one last example about this Senske Rudnik, I think Novi Pazar was also part of that program at the time, which content-wise would have opened up for many more constructive discussions on what that European program stood for, but it was complicated to establish it in form. And probably to allow for that and to allow for some space of that will actually uh, move us forward. It asks for ownership, entitlement, and real experience of co-constructing this space in place. But we need a lot more insight in how that actually will work. But I hope this gave you some idea of the European dimension. Thank you very Thank much. You. <laughs> uh, we will conclude this panel with a presentation from Mr. Goran Yanev. He is a social anthropologist interested in the fields of political anthropology and urban studies. He is also an associate professor at the University of Skopje. And he is going to talk about the recent urban changes and the recent aesthetic changes in the city of Skopje. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, so, uh, before I start, uh, because I just said uh, that, that my presentation is not timed well, so uh, uh, I will want you to remember two things, the premises on, upon which my presentation is based. And the first thing is the um, possibility of, I mean, where I'm coming from and where I'm aiming uh, in my work is the possibility of creating a community. Uh, what allows us to create a community. Uh, and uh, the second premise uh, uh, connected to this is the seeing the, the, the built environment, the symbolic landscape as a performer that has a role to play 
in this construction. Uh, short prelude in Macedonia right now, we have, a, how to say, a post-revolutionary period. We had something called uh, regime for the last 11 years. <clears throat> it was a kind of hybrid uh, uh, authoritarian uh, uh, establishment and, uh, but most important, uh, it was a form of ethnocracy. And therefore, I call it ethnocratic regime uh, because the notion of demos was erased completely. So the possibility of creating a community of uh, uh, citizens of Macedonia was erased and negated uh, purposefully from the top down, from the uh, holders of the power positions. And uh, so you, you don't need further uh, introduction about Skopje 2014, the project. Uh, you witnessed it, you heard about it, and uh, um, uh, you learned enough uh, to say, uh, so I just give you my um, slate on, on seeing the things. Uh, um, perhaps you also heard about it, but just let us be sure that we're speaking about an effort to erase the mem memory of citizens of Skopje and Macedonian citizens and to introduce a new historical narrative uh, by the means of uh, transforming the symbolic landscape uh, of the capital city. So, uh, and here you see what I mean by, by, by the performing role of the monuments in the built environment. Uh, so, uh, to, in order to juxtapose the, the, this uh, nationalistic uh, effort, which created uh, ethnic territories within the city, uh, it's not only Macedonian nationalists who are to be blamed for, for their role, in uh, painting the city as Macedonian uh, uh, historical textbook uh, that you uh, are forced to see when you walk down the downtown. But also on the Albanian part, there was a huge effort to counter uh, this, this um, symbolic marking of the city. And so now, I mean, uh, most, uh, how to say, uh, the most easy metaphor, it's not funny, it's like animals uh, uh, marking their territories by ways of pissing or scratching their skin and leaving their, 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 their smell on the, on the territory. So uh, Skopje citizens are forced to, to live by, by this design into two separate entities and uh, uh, there have been reactions and uh, resistance against it, and we will speak about it by the very end. Uh, but what, uh, what is important now uh, to speak about is the, that uh, this effort was done by an, uh, it's an uh, etatist enterprise, the whole, the whole remaking of the city of Skopje. The public space was uh, appropriated, taken by the state, and abused for their, for their uh, implementation of their ideas. Uh, and uh, simultaneously, something that we failed to notice uh, during this period as a public sphere in this uh, society um, is the, mm, what they call neoliberal appropriation, uh, capitalist appropriation of the space. At the same time, we were, mm, how to say, uh, forming about the nationalist discourse, about the, 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 the authoritarian implementation of this project, uh, that serves the goals of one party in power or the ethnic parties in power. Uh, we fail to see what happened to our city. Every corner of green space was erased, uh, appropriated, abused, and there is now some building on top of it. Uh, it's not always administrative buildings. Most of them, there are many commercial buildings and there are many residential buildings which means that the, there was a successful cap capitalist uh, 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 appropriation of space by dispossession. Uh, Macedonia has a very unhappy history of uh, uh, this transition, uh, which is an uh, organized plunder from top down. First, uh, the enterprises were uh, privatized uh, and there were no workers to, to, there was no workers movement to, to object that. Now the space is uh, privatized and there is no uh, reaction against it. It's taken the market with regulated and market is regulating it. Everybody comes to Skopje and wants to buy a flat and to move to this town because Macedonia otherwise is economically underdeveloped uh, outside of the city of Skopje in particular. Uh, 
so uh, we have these strong forces uh, that are that are um, dispossessing Macedonians, Macedonian citizens uh, from from what what's their uh, uh, privilege and right, and that's a common space. But also the debates and thinking about uh, uh, commoning, common space, and uh, right to the to the to the commons is non-existing in this country almost. And that's a, a further, how to say, a, a, a free up, and that opens another uh, possibility for free reign, uh, for free reigning of these uh, abusers uh, who are in control of the capital and who are taking control over our lives and our city. So, um, just briefly, what allowed for this kind of transformation is uh, Laclau uh, back in 1994, uh, speaking about in editing this book on political identities. Um, he speaks about the death of universal uh, 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 ideologies, uh, the two clashing competing ideologies of the time with the end of the Cold War uh, uh, collapsed and he predicted back then that we will enter into an era of particularistic uh, identities. And this we see now we witness uh, the rise of populist uh, uh, movements, right-wing populist movements all over the planet, not just in Macedonia, not just on the continent, America is a good example of that, South and North. Uh, mm, all over the former Eastern Bloc. So we are under pressure of this particular, uh, particular, particularistic uh, identity as a main uh, organizing principle for political mobilization, um, which leads us as analysts to think about um, not politics of identity, uh, but uh, makes us think about identity of politics. Uh, this will help us to deconstruct the, this politics of identity. Because if, if we are able to identify where they are coming from and how they are working upon us as citizens, then we will be able to organize and to, to resist better. Not that there are no uh, efforts for resisting uh, these, uh, how to say, tendencies for neoliberal um, appropriation of the space and common goods, but uh, we have to be better prepared. Um, so, uh, historically, briefly, uh, in the aftermath of the uh, Cold War, end of the Cold War and the solution of the Soviet Union, uh, what Kern defines uh, uh, as a ruling paradigm of time is anti-communism at any price. And this opened the process of national reconciliation and historical revisionism. Actually, revision uh, of history is a better term that the historians came up after they sobered up two decades later and uh, started speaking about this uh, revision of history, which was supposed to serve for national reconciliation, uh, which means that uh, the, uh, we have equalization of uh, fascist and communist uh, uh, regimes. Uh, which means that the Second World War is relativized because the anti-fascist struggle is no longer uh, uh, the, how to say, accepted uh, uh, and sole explanation for the for the for the for the war uh, that happened. But there were also national liberation uh, movements of other provenance, uh, which is of course uh, certainly strictly nationalist, and. Uh, Therefore, now I bring uh, into, the, uh, uh, into the play uh, um, the role of the um, socialist monuments uh, and memorial sites, which were neglected. Uh, in Skopje, you can see they are they dwarfed. You still see these uh, abstract monuments uh, standing next to these equestrian statues or, or uh, ornamental um, noise uh, that is uh, in, in Skopje uh, imposed literally above those small uh, uh, and modest um, uh, commemorative sites. But what is important to think about socialist uh, mon monuments and socialist modernism is that they were not based on the premise of uh, glorifying the vic victims. So it's not an, uh, a paradigm of victimization. It's rather, a, a how to say, a, a site of remembrance of a struggle that allows us nowadays to enter a new world. So it's a site of possibility, rather a site of, it's not backward looking, it's forward looking. 
So each of these monuments in their abstract form, with their polysemic quality, are actually invitation for thinking for the new possibilities for a new uh, uh, possibilities of a new world. So we might, might, we might be, uh, agree with the leftist ideals or not, uh, social, socialist, communist, whatever, but uh, we cannot take away this from uh, uh, as a quality of this otherwise aesthetically stunning and uh, um, excellent uh, uh, pieces of, uh, of uh, art. Uh, which also uh, have this performative role to play to, to, how to say, to bring optimism into, into, into the visitors uh, who are exposed to these uh, uh, modernist monuments. So what I just tried to say, uh, yeah, for the conclusion is that uh, this, ons this onslaught against the, the, the socialist past, against the communist past, and the reaction against this ethnocratic uh, uh, reordering of the symbolic reordering of the city of Skopje allows us actually to, to, to bring in, to invite the socialist monuments to speak again more loudly uh, uh, in high pitch voice if necessary, uh, the values contained within them. Why it's important, because for Macedonia at least it's very important and I believe for the former Yugoslav uh, 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 republics uh, in, in, in the former Yugoslav space, it's also important because they have this infrastructure of socialist monuments, modern socialist monuments, uh, because it will help us reverse again uh, the, the tide from, from the nationalist uh, 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 symbolic reordering into something else that could speak about the possibility of common uh, 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 common action and understanding of the common good and understanding of the, of the uh, um, how to say, the possibility for creating a community that is not nationalistically exclusivist, but it's rather based on the notions of internationalism, cosmopolitanism, uh, cherishing diversity and uh, bringing, uh, bringing back together the, how to say, uh, the possibility of uh, ra uh, raising above the current tide. So uh, I will stop here. I hope it's on time. And I'm sorry if I was a little bit chaotic, but I tried to be Thank as short as possible. Oh, no, it's OK. Uh, so thank you. I would like to thank again our panelists. Uh, thank you very much for your inspiring presentations. Uh, I'm sure that we are going to have a lot of questions for you today. So uh, since the audience was very patient, uh, I would like to open the floor for them. Uh, you can ask our guests what would you like to know. Anna? Uh, oh, so many hands, but five questions, that's it. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to reflect on Daniela's presentation and possibly clarify some of the things um, about the genesis of culture centers, which are undoubtedly the great legacy that we inherited, not only in ex-Yugoslavian countries, but in Europe. Uh, it seems sort of a bit um, awkward, to use the word of the day, uh, to determine them as this romanticized idea of workers making their own culture content, which it was in a sense on a micro location, but they were sort of part of the larger political agenda of then what they called elementary diffusion of culture. And they did have a strong sort of political mandate of what to do and how to do it. And another thing that I wanted to reflect is that the culture centers that we remember from those days um, could not uh, survive, in a sense, in the, in, in the times where the cultural consumption or even like engaging with the arts of culture has dramatically changed. In a sense of, A, we don't have workers who work in factories. We don't even have the industrial setting. B, the technology has taken its toll, right? With, with the culture creation, there's, there's no need for the space for the general public. Hence, what we find today, and I think it might be beneficial maybe sometime to develop a sort of discussion in that direction, is what we call like new generation of culture centers which rest predominantly 
what I touched upon this morning on the organizations of civil society and artists as sort of places of work and places of sort of new places of social interaction where civil society organizations and artists that are sort of dumped with the precarious sort of work conditions get finally some sort of infrastructure to develop the work. So in a sense, so the whole idea of culture centers has to be redefined and repositioned. And also talking about the private sort of entities taking over um, infrastructure, there are numerous really cool examples all over Europe where private sort of organizations did take over, like real estate developers in Belgian Leuven took over the whole uh, compound of ex-brewery Stella Artois, but they did sort of preserve the culture center and opened it to the new community. And um, in Croatia, that's the only sort of, I think, pride that I could have in our systemic step forwards, is that the topic of culture centers and new culture centers is now becoming one of the agendas for the policy change because what we heard this morning, a theater can position itself according to its artistic, poetic, political engagement, and even representational idea of what a theater does, whether it's a mainstream political experimental or what not. Culture centers are always the spaces to again use the word of the day in between. They are non-defined artistically and culturally spaces. Hence, they are left even in the gap of legislation where they are swooshed from national to the local to the regional levels. So apart from A, sort of anchoring them as to what they are today, they have to be anchored systematically in the policy provisions so they do have a direction in which they can develop. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Okay, shortly. Okay, um, well, uh, I really need to... Um, uh, First of all, I need to say that, of course, my explanation was a kind of simplified and goes into the direction that I wanted to point out. Of course, that the state, uh, I mean, there are these kind of theories that actually the state organizes uh, cultural centers to, as a kind of uh, places to, to spread the dominant uh, communist ideology in almost every village. But if you really look closer, you will see that this was not exactly the true, uh, because these uh, houses of the cultures were really, in a many levels, exist as a kind of projection of the uh, working class uh, culture. Uh, this is something that we don't have today, definitely, and I absolutely agree, don't, uh, disagree that we today don't have a workers. We have, but we don't see them at all. Especially culture class don't see these people at all, and we have a pure Africanization of Balkan at the moment, and we are totally detached from, from these uh, questions at all, and cultural class start uh, fighting for its own interest at the moment when their interests start to be uh, uh, yeah, brought into question. Because at the, with the first wave of privatization, we have a disasters in the, uh, that happen to the people who work in the factories and so on. The second way of privatization, you have attack on the middle class. And cultural workers are exactly this uh, kind of people. I mean, the, the uh, taxes goes up, electricity bills go up. I mean, and the cultural worker become kind of proletaria, uh, proletarianized, no? In a sense, uh, what uh, the, the lady from syndicate was saying, she, uh, I mean, the cultural workers are receiving the same amount of money as the factory workers and so on. So at the moment when their class interest was brought into question, then they start organizing themselves into association of independent scene, into syndicates, and so on, to fight for their own class interest. And I, I am absolutely sure that that interest is not a public and interest of all, it is interest of certain class of people. I'm sorry, this is my position. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh, sorry. Uh, you can give her a microphone, Maria. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Liliana. 
I wasn't able to understand how is actually a railway a non-place. I wasn't able to identify characteristics of a railway as a non-place. I see that it's a abandoned place and it is used uh, by the poor and the students, but I think of a railway more of a, more as of a place of uh, heterotopia or with elements of dystopia, but a non-place is problematic for me. Um, I mean, it's a real place and a real space. It's a real topography and mental topography in the landscape or in memory and how it is a non-place. Then I, um, I think there is, in your work, lack of a model. What is the model you are offering and who are the, I don't know, um, participants and collaboratives that you are mentioning? If that is based on artistic intervention, <clears throat> then I think that this is more of a um, excluding model than ex in inclusive model. Um, so that, that is the question. I mean, uh, why a non-place characteristics at what is the model? What is the good, public good, uh, of a railway as a public space? Thank you. Thank you very much for the challenging and, and uh, good questions, because actually um, I included the notions of uh, non-place and uh, whole theoritization by Mark Oje. I'm sorry that Professor Milena is not here right now, <laughs> because that was her idea. And uh, yes, but it's, it's not contesting what I want to say. It's basically um, because I wanted to, uh, in a way, problematize that notion of non-place as a negative connotation in relation to railway stations. Let's, let's uh, keep ourselves at that uh, moment. So um, that was your first question. And the second, relating to the model, uh, my intention was not to offer any model or even kind of solution just to um, present or to offer uh, my thinking of the railway stations as possibility, as possible public spaces, which, yes, but public spaces for the common action, for the collaborative actions, whether it is through exclusively artistic presentations, as we saw that exhibition in Belgrade, or maybe as something that is completely different. To be very honest, uh, I don't know whether I will find the really good, so to say, case to uh, support my ideas, because I'm really at the very beginning of research. Yeah, so please do, because I really wanted to have in more input on uh, the existing practices or even models. Who knows, maybe they exist already. So thank you. Maybe I can Maybe I can just add a little bit. There was a lot of these uh, traveling groups, uh, like in Soviet Union at the beginning of the revolution, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the prolet cult uh, ideas of uh, and Bogdanov's ideas of that every uh, human being need to be kind of creative and uh, uh, able to transform this uh, world politically and aesthetically and so on, blah blah. Uh, there was a lot of this. Uh, there was actually one project, but I, I, um, one troop I can can't now remember the name, but I will. Uh, it, it exists exactly through the train. The train was passing through different uh, spaces, and where train stops, they make kind of show, theater, thing. But we can think about these kind of uh, things as a kind of temporary institutions, not to have kind of one stable thing. But I think maybe as a cultural worker, this is really kind of interesting to think into that direction. Because if we 
consider that we do, if, for example, we imagine that we don't want to put from above the concept of institution on someone, maybe we can attack interfering by this kind of temporary, uh, uh, temporary institutions that are just popping up and disappearing or kind of interfering. I, I mean, it's interesting to think into that direction. Uh, thank you very much for this fruitful discussion. We have no more time to talk officially, uh, but we can... Okay, one more question. I cannot see you, sorry, because... It's impossible, <laughs> it's, it's impossible to see you. Uh, first, uh, about... Um, First of all, I want to say that this was really a fruitful discussion and thanks to the Friedrich Ebert uh, Stiftung because uh, I think that these kind of discussions are really necessary. So I'm, uh, I mean, uh, I'm really happy that we are late and that we are discussing along. So I find that the suggestion that our question should be shorter quite irritating, most honestly. So the first question is, uh, I want to ask, um, uh, the first uh, two uh, de debaters, so Natasha, uh, Miss Natasha, uh, please, and Miss Liliana, uh, you, uh, how, what kind of research exactly did you do? Because this, uh, for example, this uh, hotel of Tro uh, in Trogir was not uh, available for the working class, and this was available only for those that were close to the army or to some political circles. So. Uh, and to, to those of the Secret Service, I wonder, do you keep on, uh, how, what kind of research did you do? And do you do it still and do you do it now? And in this moment, in, in, in that manner. The second question is um, for um, Miss Klaas uh, Kevos. So I would like to ask you, considering your cultural labyrinth that you're suggesting, uh, uh, do, isn't that uh, it, it was established in uh, Holland like uh, 10 years ago, but it was considered to be quite dangerous. For example, look what happened to Mr. Uh, to the director uh, Theo van Gogh. So, so please explain us because everybody, it seems like everybody can enter in that labyrinth. And the third question is uh, for Mr. Goran Yanov, because uh, uh, he commented as this uh, architecture catastrophe, but I think that the main problem is that uh, there were, for example, two professors, one from the King Kong uh, College from, from uh, London and the other one from Bologna University. And there were, for example, for the King's College, there were four people. One of them was, was I. That was a d discussion. It was in the Army Dome here. And he explained that the professors that are at the architecture department in the Skopje University, they are building, for example, the um, uh, student uh, dom Duomo in uh, Skopje is a copy of the, um, of the building in Britain. So that's why they cannot comment the new uh, plagiarism because they, they also did the same. So I wonder, just wonder how come nobody came to these dis discussions from the university and how come Come, this wasn't. I completely agree that, that this what is, what is done in Skopje is a catastrophe, criminal, criminal activity. First of all, but those that were supposed to comment this, they couldn't because they did uh, in the previous si system the same thing. Okay, just shortly, one sentence by each other. <laughs> uh, I don't know where did you get the information that the motel uh, in Trogir was used by army officials because it was not, it was built in the beginning of the, of developing actually a big uh, plan for tourism for Yugoslavia and actually it served as a place of temporary, like um, uh, Trogir was transitory uh, station so really people who had the car, which was some sort of, uh, I guess, middle class of Yugoslavia, used it, everybody used it, including foreign tourists who were just starting to come in a, in a bigger amount in, in Yugoslavia. And uh, my father worked at the reception. So I don't, uh, he would tell me if this was a military zone. It was a hotel. This was just one sentence. Um, ah, they were, um, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, for me, just to, to, to answer, it's a part of the academic research, so a combination of uh, ethnographic methods, narrative interpretation, so that's, that's it. It's a very modest and, uh, I would say, 
that Klaske? Yeah. Yes, to be honest, I wasn't exactly sure what the relation was with the Theo van Gogh discussion and what I've been... been yeah, I, I know that story, but I, I don't see the link necessarily with, with what I was presenting. In, 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 in what? In, in European culture programs? Or Okay, now, I mean, what I, what I meant with that is, you know, but because, I mean, this has to do also with governing on, on European Union level, that the Commission sets the guidelines, you know, and they have often a mismatch with what's happening on the local level. And what I'm saying is very often they then just stay at the Commission, they provide the funding, but are never there when the projects have to be brought into practice, despite the many different discrepancies and not, you know, the lack of knowledge of what's actually at stake at the local level. So in my case, this was not related, you know, to a fake or discussion like Theo van Gogh. This is really about implementing cultural policy, we need, which needs more than from a distance setting criteria, but needs, you know, an insight in the translation process of these processes into practice. That is really what I referred to. Yeah. Goran, shortly. Yeah, I have no answer for the question. I don't know why somebody went or didn't went to something uh, in Skopje. Uh, and it's a question outside of my presentation, so I don't know how to relate to it. So it's, it's an observation that you made, and thank you for that. I don't know how to answer. Okay, thank you very much for your patience. We have no more time to talk officially, but you can continue to talk with each other during the lunch. <laughs>